Hello, and welcome to another special installment of a new bonus series here at Cinemaholics that is called Extra Milestone. I'm John Negroni, and with me I have from the internet, Pennsylvania, get him another cup of, we swear it's coffee, Will Ashton. Hello. And of course, don't call him Geraldine or Daphne, from the internet Colorado, back from last month's excursion with the Extra Milestone series, and he's been on Cinemaholics so many times. Hello, Sam Noland. Hello, John Negroni, and hello, Cinemaholics. I'm, it's, uh, it's good to be back on the show once again. That's right. Now, if you're listening and you're curious, you've never heard of Extra Milestone, Extra Milestone is a special bonus series that we're doing at Cinemaholics once a month. If you're a patron, you get to listen to this a little bit early than everyone else. But the whole point of Extra Milestone is that we are celebrating an anniversary or milestone for a big film. Last month, we talked about It Happened One Night, which celebrated its 85th anniversary. It came out, of course, in 1934. This is the month of, or this is March, the month of 2019. So we're going back in time to 1959, 25 years Mm -hmm. after It Happened One Night. And we're going to talk about a film that also has a lot of romance, a lot of comedy, and another film that's in black and white. And that film is Some Like It Hot. Now, here is the deal for this episode. We are going to be discussing, first up, the background and what the deal is with Some Like It Hot. I mean, who made it and why did they make it? And then we're going to get into the legacy of this film, setting up its place in film history, why this milestone of 60 years is so incredible. And then we're going to, from there, actually talk about the film itself. Now, if you've never seen Some Like It Hot from Billy Wilder, then you can definitely listen to the background information. And and when we're talking about how this film has sort of fit into pop culture, you won't get spoiled on anything. But once we start talking about the plot, once Will Ashton starts giving the plot synopsis, that's your cue to stop listening, stop what you're doing, go check out Some Like It Hot. (laughs) We highly recommend it. And we're going to talk about how we watch the film first before we do anything else. And let's start with you, Sam Nolan. Uh, Tell us your first experience watching Some Like It Hot. And then when you rewatched it, how did you come across it this time? Uh, It's funny because uh, in preparation for this episode, I was trying to remember why I watched it the first time. It was about two years ago. Uh, and I think I just sort of watched it on a whim. I was sort of just like, hey, I've never seen that movie before, and I see it on a lot of uh, best of lists. Let me give it a watch. And turns out there was they all those lists were completely correct. I loved it. Uh, I absolutely loved it uh, first time. And then rewatching it again just yesterday, I uh, I loved it just as much. And I've I've uh, I've grown a little bit as a viewer. So I was I was uh, even more excited to sort of uh, to sort of observe. The the nuances of you the story. You caught a few of the innuendos this time, Sam. Yeah, a few more of them this time. <laughs> yes, I've I've I'm not a child anymore. I like. Well, to how old are you when you watched it the first time? Oh gosh, seventeen, I think. Okay, so what are those things? Hold that thought, then, because we got to talk about the progression. Yeah, between the first time you watched it and then now rewatching it again, because I think that mm. can speak a lot to the film. Oh uh, yeah. But okay, Will Ashton, what about you? What was what was your first experience with this one? And I think I know the answer to the question, but I think you've made it seem like it's a little complicated for you. So what's going on? Yeah, um, this is the first time I saw it in full, but I've seen part of it before. I, I know I've seen like clips of it in passing. And I remember in college, my senior year, I took, um, I believe it was film and comedy was the court's name. And uh, we watched, I believe, uh, I, I thought I watched about like 30 minutes of it at the time. But upon watching the film now, I feel like we might have only watched maybe like 15 or 20 minutes unless I forgot a good chunk of what we saw because like the only thing I remember from seeing the film was the first like introduction at the train which I thought was going to be earlier in the film based on when we saw it and then the very very end of the film like the last like 10 or 15 minutes so uh yeah I guess I would have seen about like maybe 15 or 20 minutes of it before so this is my first time watching it in its entirety from beginning to end awesome now I saw this one on prime video but I would have bought it, <laughs> you know, if I mm-hmm. if I only had that option because I adore this movie. I first saw it back when I was in college, and one of my college dorm mates, he and I were talking about our favorite directors, and I was like, I love Richard Linklater, and I was talking about, you know, Dazed and Confused, and before I think only two of them were out at the time, and he was like, 
no, 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 no. Billy Wilder, right? So the first time I was introduced to Billy Wilder was through some Like It Hot. Now I've seen a lot of his other films since then, of course. And The Apartment, which came out a year later, is my favorite film of all time. And mm-hmm. I have to credit Some Like It Hot as the film that sort of introduced me to what I think is one of the best directors of all time. Definitely one of my favorite directors of all time. And of course, we can speak more to that later. And yeah, so I saw this one on Prime Video, but I have a feeling it probably would have been in my local library. Uh, but what about you, Sam? Uh, how did you find this one? Uh, the first time I, I rented it on uh, iTunes or Amazon or one of those services. Um, but this time I did take a jaunt over to the library. It was there. Uh, it had a nice uh, nice DVD. And that's something I've, I've been doing a lot more recently uh, is uh, is uh, heading over to the library. They have a lot of things that aren't online. So that was yeah. that was very helpful. There's a library within walking distance of my house, so I'm very fortunate. And yeah, that's majority of the films that I want to check out. I tend to check there first. But and then what about you? Of course, Blash. Uh, yeah, I watched it on Amazon Prime. I got a friend who let me lend their account, so that's how I saw it. Ooh, oh, fancy. there you go. Yeah, somebody's <laughs> got friends. All right. Yes. Well, well, I didn't realize what must that be like. Because it's my first time seeing a movie on Amazon Prime. I didn't realize that they give like little like factoids or like little like yeah uh, the IMDb trivia. Yeah, I was like, wow, this is neat. Like the X ray, they call it. I believe what a time to be alive. Like you know, like you just get these little facts. (laughs) I'll probably present a few that I caught, but uh, I sure you have a good list of them, John, on your docket. I've got a few, but I'll be counting on you as well. And yeah, I love that feature. I I think I first noticed that when the first season of Man in the High Castle came out. It was like one of the first times I ever started watching prime video myself and it's definitely something that i wish more streaming services would actually do because it's so wonderful (laughs) it doesn't show up on everything that's on the prime video catalog but obviously the original stuff has it and you know you actually see which actors play who and it's it's really fun for anybody who really wants to dig even deeper into a film or tv show they're watching prime video has got some cool features so but okay let's talk about the background of this film Some Like It Hot came out on March 29th, 1959. So that means it's celebrating 60 years. And I think I would consider it a classic. I mean, who wouldn't? Um, Maybe we can talk more about that. I I know, Sam, you've got some details to provide us in terms of how this film's legacy holds up. But going back in time a little bit, it was directed, produced, and co-written by Billy Wilder, as we mentioned. It was also co-written by Wilder's longtime writing partner, I.A.L. Diamond, who, again, he co-wrote with Wilder just a year later on my favorite films of all time, The Apartment. And when I say one of, it's because I have two favorite films of all time. It just depends on the day you're asking me. Today, it's The Apartment. Tomorrow, mm. who knows? Maybe you should ask me. But um, yes, <laughs> some like it hot. Uh, the film stars Marilyn Monroe, Tony Curtis, and Jack Lemmon. And what's amazing to me, too, about this film was I, you know, the fir- I didn't realize this the first time I was watching it, but when I actually was digging a little deeper into the making of this movie, I did not know that Jack Lemmon was a complete unknown at this time. He, his star power wasn't really there, but this is the film that would go on to really launch Jack Lemmon's career. The Apartment won Best Picture a year later, but that was, of course, Jack Lemmon again. But what's interesting about this one is the only reason he's in this film is because they couldn't get Frank Sinatra. Or as the legend goes, Billy Wilder wanted Jack Lemmon, so he says. Frank Sinatra stood him up for a meeting or a lunch, and then he was like, well, whatever, I want Jack Lemmon anyway. And because (laughs) of that, they could actually afford to bring on Jack Lemmon instead, and Tony Curtis and Marilyn Monroe. It just sort of worked out that way, because I think think the idea was they were going to have Mitzi Gaynor instead of Marilyn Monroe. Tony Curtis was there pretty early on, and then Frank Sinatra was going to be in the Jack Lemmon role. And I got to say, as much as I love Sinatra and Gaynor, how can you imagine anybody else in these roles? I truly can't. And I also have to point out, uh, I was rewatching the opening credits, and I don't know how I missed this the first time, or the second time, or the third or fourth, but this was made by Ashton Productions. Now, Oh, yeah. Hmm. My bloodline. Will, Will Ashton, <laughs> this is your opportunity to tell us once and for all uh, about your legacy, about some of the things you've been... You've been I think Sam's exact words earlier uh, when we were chatting was, uh, it's time for you to fess up. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm a timeless being. Uh, I I produced some like it hot, so it might be a bit of a contradiction to uh, speak on this film, and it's kind of surprising I hadn't seen it until now, all things considered. But uh, yeah, no, I um, so coy. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I I don't know. I, I don't believe I have any relation to this Ashton as far as I know. But I did. I perked up as well when I saw that. I was like, oh, yeah. Well, it was a funny thing, too, because uh, in this movie, there is a train called, I think it's the Florida Line or something like that, that it actually doesn't go anywhere near Chicago, but it does go through Pennsylvania. So oh, clearly okay. that was a nice little uh, Easter egg that Will's grandfather oh, yeah. placed right into. Uh, that would be like my great, great grandfather in this scenario. What? No, or, no actually. Well, no, no, I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm thinking because I'm mixing up the time, the movie with the release uh, date. That's right. So would, sorry. Not, it wouldn't be 39. It'd be, yeah, you're right. It's 59. So yeah, it would be my great grandfather. Yeah, we'll definitely get into that. But yes, this film, even though it came out in 1959, it takes place in 1929, 30 years before. And we should also say it is a very loose remake of a French film that was made in 1935. It's called Fanfare of Love. I have not seen it, but I looked into it a bit in the basic premise and it's so different. It's completely different. The mobster angle where this kind of starts off and has that subplot, that was the invention of Billy Wilder and Diamond. They sort of put that in there because they thought it'd be a nice extra motivator to, well, the cross-dressing that happens in Some Like It Hot. So uh, yeah, you could say in terms of the jokes, the tone, and a lot of the plot, Some Like It Hot is pretty original and it's a very risky film, which we'll get into. It definitely isn't the kind of film that you expect to be as big of a hit in the time it came out in, but I guess we can get into that now. So Sam Noland, this film has been out for 60 years. What do people think of it? You know, it's, it's uh, we've sort of alluded to a little bit, but it's considered widely to be one of the best movies of all time. And uh, I have to say that I do concur with that. It is, uh, as you mentioned, it was sort of responsible for putting Jack Lemmon on the map, so to speak. Uh, and it's also notable for being Marilyn Monroe's last big performance. Uh, I think I probably think the Misfits. biggest one after this. Yeah, The Misfits was probably the one after this uh, before her uh, untimely death in 1962. And, um, according to the Amazon Prime trivia, she was pregnant at the time <laughs> she made this film. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So when they, I watched a documentary about this some time back, and apparently when they were filming the the scenes in the beach, which takes place in San Diego, or it doesn't take place in San Diego, they filmed it in San Diego at the Coronado, Del Coronado Hotel. I've been to it. It's amazing. And it's like, you actually go there, and you, it's like you're 1929 again. So it was a great casting Does it location. Does say, um, like, as seen in some, like, a hot anywhere? Uh, I don't remember, actually. I don't, okay. I don't think it is. But, yeah, it looks just like it. Like, they never change it. It's, it's just so old-fashioned. Yeah, but yeah. it was the first shooting location, and she was pregnant during those scenes. And that's when the film was going its smoothest. But then, yeah, she had a lot of trouble when she had her miscarriage. I think it was her second miscarriage, I want to say. And, obviously, that created a lot of problems on set for her. And it, it's a fascinating documentary, and it, it talks about how she was able to cope with depression on set. And if listeners don't know, Marilyn Monroe suffered a lot from a very traumatic background, childhood. Her career is very fascinating. She's a very fascinating person, and unfortunately, she committed suicide a few years later. But, this, yeah, like you said, one of her last probably the film the last best film that she made i was just gonna say it's sort of her uh defining role in a lot of ways it's sort of like the yeah. caricature of marilyn monroe among some others maybe like the, seven year uh, itch seven so. year yeah, itch say, probably yeah. seven year inch is probably the, yeah but that's pretty the close it's definitely up there. any any time she worked with billy wilder it was it was definitive let's put it that <laughs> way Right. Yeah. So she did Seven Year Itch with him uh, a few years before this, right? And that's where the famous the the subway grate, right, or the manhole grate scene where it goes up under her dress happens, and there's a nice little Ooh. nice little Easter egg yes. in some like it hot. I was gonna say, was that a reference to that at that one point in the train oh, yes. scene? Okay, I wasn't sure because I, I was I wasn't sure exactly if this came up before or after that film. So after. when I was watching it, I mean, I, when I was watching it, I mean, yeah, I you could sort of argue this, but I think. It's. I found that it's sort of the most culturally uh, prevalent movie of Bill of uh, Billy Wilder's. Maybe not like uh, the best one is. Uh, it's not widely considered to be the best one or anything. Um, but it's the one that's sort of leaked into the culture a lot. There's a whole lot of uh, just just quotes and uh, scenarios from this movie that I'm sure we'll reference a little later on that are just so memorable and they're still funny to this day. Probably the most interesting thing to this movie, at least specific to its time period was how it sort of wrestled with the production code, which we brought up uh, a couple times on our previous episode with It Happened One Night. Uh, It was 1959, so it was sort of the waning years of it. This 
fact is sort of contested, but it's said that the, uh, that the production code sort of just sort of, they just sort of let this one slide a little bit, even though it was condemned after it came out by what was called the Catholic Legion of Decency, which is a name mm. I dearly love, uh, <laughs> banned wholesale from Kansas, I believe. I um, think the quote is, they considered it too disturbing for Kansas, which I love. <laughs> the yes, cross-dressing Kansas in particular. Kansas can't handle it. Uh, I guess so. Um, no, yeah, Kansas and uh, the other uh, sort of interesting thing is that because of this, because it was allowed to let slide, it sort of was like sort of this pivotal moment when it came to uh, specific issues touched on in the movie, like uh, homosexuality and transgenderism and everything. And so it was sort of like almost in a weird way, sort of the, sort of a test for the public to see if they could air quote handle it. I mean, obviously that sounds sort of absurd now, but it was really like the world would be probably quite different were it not for this movie uh, in terms of that, at least. That's pretty fair. Yeah. Because this is, during a time when homosexuality and transgenderism are so taboo, I mean, they're so far away from the mainstream that a movie can sort of play it for laughs. I mean, there are literally lines of dialogue in here where it's like, a guy can't marry a guy, you know, things like that. <laughs> and it's so crazy to watch that with modern eyes, right? The more you look into it, the more you wonder, I alluded to it before, but what a risky film. When they first tested it, you know, the legend has it that sometimes they say nobody laughed in the first test screening they ever did for this because people didn't know that it was a comedy. They had people walking out with their kids. There are a yeah. few people who say Probably there was- Probably in Kansas, right? No, no, it was in <laughs> California, I believe. Ooh. And yeah, yeah, I think they they did that. The first, uh, the first screening was somewhere in Beverly Hills or something like that. And apparently one person did laugh the entire time and he bragged years later about how he was the first person to kind of get this movie. But yeah, it was a disaster. It was probably Billy Wilder movie. in disguise. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure he was that. Good. This is a film that's all about disguises, right? But yeah, so they they were like they were panicking and they're like, oh, what are we gonna do? We have to we have to get people to love this film. We have to you know, change it. We have to edit it and all this stuff. Billy Wilder comes back and he's like, yeah, I cut out sixty seconds. And they're like, that's all you did? He cut out a, a one scene from the train. He's like, yeah, the train thing could be a little snappier. <laughs> and so they they've screened it again though. This time they screened it to a much younger audience. I think mostly college students. And they mm. loved it, lost their minds. And some of the people who were there have said you, you could barely hear the dialogue because there was so much laughter. And that's when they knew <laughs> they had a hit in their hands. Wow, that's that's funny. I, I wonder I bet it would probably be like the opposite effect today. College students now are sort of uh, notorious for being sort of hard to hard to please with certain issues like this. So it's, it's right. just sort you of show a, them. Yeah, it's like the comedy of South Park or something like that. The yeah. more cynical uh, yeah, because this film is far from cynical. It's just very, very <laughs> funny in a pure way. So yeah, so this film, it would go on to be the highest grossing comedy of 1959. And up until that point, the highest grossing comedy ever. But mm. it lost all but one of its Oscar nominations to a little movie called Ben-Hur. Uh, yeah, Sam, a little movie. And Sam, you've talked about Ben-Hur on some Cinemaholic things before, right? Uh, yeah, maybe that, or maybe, uh, anyway, that's all I got or something, but I have brought it up before. Yeah. Yeah. But what do you, what do you think of that one? Because I mean, this was a big, 1959 was a big year. I'm sure some people are list, listening Huge and wondering why year. we're not talking about that film instead of this one. Uh, well, partly because it was released in November, so it technically wouldn't work out, but yeah, I, I love Ben Hur. I think it's fantastic. I think, I'm, I, I think some like it hot is a better movie, but Ben Hur is like a best picture movie, you know? So I'm not terribly, uh, upset about the 60 year old Oscar awards. I do think it's, it's sort of frustrating that it wasn't nominated for best picture. I'm like, I'm sure, yeah, weird. I'm sure at least a couple of the nominees for that year have been largely forgotten. But yeah, it is, it is certainly deserved all of its nominations and probably a few wins, but whatever. It, what, what are you going to do? I guess. Right. It did win Best Costume Design in the Black and White category. Ori Kelly, of course, was the fashion designer. And I actually looked this up because I was curious. I was like, man, Ori Kelly did a lot of films. So I actually tallied it up and I manually checked how many films Ori Kelly consulted on. 305 <laughs> film credits for costume design. Goodness. Unbelievable. And yeah. I do want to say, I, I can't let this point slide. I, I would take Some Like It Hot as Best Picture over Ben-Hur any day. I, I love okay. some like it hot. 
I don't love Ben Hur, but that's a conversation really? for another day. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Will I don't know, Will, if you have a, a take on that one, but yeah. I actually have not seen Ben Hur all the way. Oh through, my goodness, so. Will. Uh, well, I want to see in theaters. That's the main thing. Like I don't want. It's, it's it, going to be like, in theaters my in April. That's how I am with Lawrence of Arabia. It's like I want to watch that film, but I don't want to I mean, watch I, it I saw on a small it, screen. Yeah. I saw Lawrence of Arabia in theaters, so I I, I got a chance to see it the way I felt it was intended mm. to be seen. Ben Hur, I haven't right. been fortunate enough to experience it that way, so I feel like rather than see it in a like uh subpar version i guess i rather would see it in the full thing unless i get like a super 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 widescreen version of the film yeah well you're totally in luck will because that. fathom events is releasing ben-hur in april of 2019 oh, yeah? so real, now huh? is the time yes oh okay yeah. i'll have to schedule half my day to see it <laughs> yes that's right we'll be <laughs> yeah, pestering it you. that's like a four-hour movie isn't it it is four hours all mm. right awesome well we're not here to talk about ben-hur Thankfully, oh, just kidding. Very <laughs> by today's standards, very terrific movie. I didn't even watch the remake because why bother? But Will Ashton, well, it was let's... a remake, but still. Oh yeah, that's right. There was a 1925 version, right, or 1929, yeah. something like that. 25, but, not great. Yeah, yeah, but I think the chariot, the chariot race is what I remember from the first first one, and it's yeah. pretty good in that one. I, that I is think, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Let's actually talk about Some Like It Hot. From this point forward, we are going to be talking about specific things that happen all over this movie. Not a ton of spoilery things, but I'm, eventually we will be talking about the ending and things like that. So if you've never seen Some Like It Hot, drop what you're doing. Don't don't keep listening. Go check out Some Like It Hot. It's, it's available. It's out there. Even if you don't have Prime Video, go to your library. Ask a friend. Do what you got to do. Phone a friend, lifelines, all that stuff. And then come back here and have, have a conversation with us. So Will Ashton... Some Like It Hot, what is it about? Yeah, so the movie, as you mentioned before, it takes place in 1929, either I would say the middle or the end of Prohibition. Do you know exactly? It's at the, it's at the height of Prohibition. I think Prohibition was I, on its way to ending, yeah. Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. It was, that's what I mean, like mid to end point, right? So right. there's like uh, speakeasies and there's just like everyone is just kind of drinking, but in secret, not really like hiding it particularly well, but everyone is trying to get their drink on. And uh, we enter the story basically through one of these speakeasies where we meet uh, Joe, who's played by Tony Curtis, and Jerry, who's played by Jack Lemmon. Uh, they are a saxophone and bass player, and they uh, are just kind of coasting by as best they can. But based on the limitations of their feel, especially in the Prohibition era, they can't really get too many gigs. And they're basically on their last legs. Uh, it's also kind of implied, well, not really kind of, that um, Joe has a bit of a gambling addiction. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's also another reason why they're not always uh, strapped with cash. So uh, they find out about a gig in uh, Florida, I believe, right? Right, yeah. Um, yeah, and they uh, it's perfect for them. They're looking for a bass player and a saxophone player uh, through somewhat kind of contrived reasons. Like, as far as, like, the reasons why the, the actual <laughs> players couldn't do it, like, one got pregnant and one something else, right? It was, like, yeah. just kind of, like, very screenwritery, but that's a minor, minor, minor uh, nitpick. Uh, but, anyway, it's a perfect gig for them. Uh, the only problem is they need women instead of men. So, uh, through uh, some circumstances involving a couple gangsters, they decide to take the gig and uh, essentially dress up as women in order to uh, kind of sneak into Florida and hide away from the gangsters who are on their tail. And that's, I guess, as far as I can go without diving too much deeper, right? I guess so. And it should be stress that when you're watching this movie, this movie does feel like it really needs a good reason to get these two very different guys to cross dress, right? <laughs> and it has to happen in a way where the audience is on board, where the audience is like, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> and that's why I think the mobster angle is so brilliant, especially because they have George Raft and Pat O'Brien in there who actually, it's, it's like the equivalent of having, you know, Robert De Niro. Yeah, I was gonna say, they, they play it completely straight, which I think totally works do. for this film. Yeah, But it's also parroting the gangster movies of the 40s and 50s. Right. And because but, it's like, in black and white, yeah. yeah, because it's black and white and they're playing it straight, that's partly why a lot of people were confused in that first test screening because they didn't get that it was a comedy. And so yeah. the minute that you're introduced to Joe and Jerry, that's the clue that, okay, this is going to be funny. Because up until that point, Spats Colombo shows up and I think there's the guy who wants another cup of coffee. And that's like the closest thing you get to a laugh. Maybe the guy who's like... The vodka coffee, bourbon coffee, that that's a funny line. But it's really right. this first interaction with Joe and Jerry where you get the hint. So I'm actually going to play this clip because 
I think for anybody who's listening who just wants a really good example of how to introduce your characters in a screenplay, I think this is about as good as it gets. So here's a clip. This is in the funeral parlor where they're actually playing that gig that you were talking about, Will. And this is our introduction to Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis. Say, Joe, tonight's the night, isn't it? I'll say. Well, no, tonight's the night we get paid. That's good. Why? Oh, I am fiddling among my back teeth. I got to see a dentist tomorrow. Dennis, we've been out of work for four months. You want to blow your first week's pay on your teeth? Well, it's, it's just a filling here. I have to be gold. I have to be gold. How can you be so selfish? We owe back rent. We're in for $89 to Moe's Delicatessen. Three Chinese lawyers are suing us because our check bounced at the laundry. We borrowed money from every girl in the line. You're right. Well, of course I'm First thing tomorrow, we'll pay everybody a little something on account, huh? Oh, no, we don't. We don't? No, first thing tomorrow, we go out to the dog track and put the whole bundle on greased lightning. Greased lightning? You're going to bet my money on a dog? He's a shoo I got it from Max the waiter. His brother-in-law is the electrician that wise the rabbit. What are you giving me with a rabbit? Look at the odds. He's standing one tomorrow. We'll pay everybody. Suppose he loses. What are you worried about? This job is going to last a long time. I suppose it doesn't. Jerry boy, why do you have to paint everything so black? Oh, suppose you got hit by a truck. Suppose the stock market crashes. Suppose Mary Pickford divorces Douglas Fairbanks. Suppose the Dodgers leave Brooklyn. Joe? Suppose Lake Michigan overflows. Well, don't look now, but the whole town is underwater. All right, we should say... All of those predictions, of course, come <laughs> true. And that's that, that's a good example, though, of a joke that is funny because of the era, but it still works, right? It, it's still a joke that works no matter where in history you're watching it. But of course, yeah, I, I personally did not know the Dodgers even were in Brooklyn. So it tells you how big a baseball <laughs> yeah. fan I am. But yeah, this scene's great. Sam, Sam, what do you what do you think of Joe and Jerry and their dynamic and how they play off each other? Well, I think it, it's uh, a, they have very, very good uh, screen chemistry together. One thing I love about this movie that I noticed right off the bat with this first scene is that it's just so damn zippy, and I love it. It's not like it's not like the comedies, a lot of the comedies we get nowadays, where uh, where it's sort of a little more off the cuff and a little more riffy and a little more improv-y. You can tell this is written like very meticulously and very funnily. And that they, you have these actors who just know how to make those lines sound natural and sound good and also be funny, I think is magnificent. And obviously, they sort of go at odds with each other at various points throughout the movie. And I think that makes for a lot of a lot more of the comedy. So, yeah, I think they're great together. I think uh, uh, I don't I'm not not as familiar with Tony Curtis as I am with Jack Lemmon. But this is this is a uh, this, this is almost as good as it gets when it comes to comedic pairings, I think. I'm glad you mentioned the screenplay, of course, because one of my favorite things about Billy Wilder is his directing style, which is he sticks really close to the script in terms of dialogue, mainly because he wrote it, but also with I.L. Diamond, of course, and also a couple other people before. I think Diamond was his second partner, and he was, I mean, this guy made movies like every year, so it's not like Wilder was known for only having one set of people that he worked with, but... Yeah, he would improvise, though. There were things that he would put into the film based on suggestions from his actors. But when it came to the timing and when it came to the specific dialogue, he was pretty stringent about it, except for one piece of dialogue that we'll get to. And it's it's actually the last thing that caps the film. But we'll hold off on that for now. But yeah, so, th- so we have Joe and Jerry and... I, I really love how they interplay. I love how Joe is this really confident, you know, we see him womanizing quite a bit and we see Jerry just call, kind of fall in line with whatever Joe says. And it kind of speaks a lot to their friendship. Will, when you were watching them on screen, were you thinking to yourself, okay, which one is Will Ashton and which one is John Negroni? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm curious if you say that, which one do you consider me to be and which one do you consider yourself to be? Oh, man, I, I think that's a, a can of worms. I don't know if I want to oh, get okay. into. I <laughs> sure. Um, but I, I kind of want to go off of one of uh, okay, uh, one of Sam's points. I, was, I don't know, for some strange reason, throughout the movie, this isn't really a modern film, but I kept thinking a lot about Ishtar. Have you guys seen Ishtar? No. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> you, you guys see where I'm going with this? Yes, it, yes. It has kind of like, it, it's not the same premise, obviously, but it has like kind of like a similar dynamic. I never even films, thought about that. You're absolutely right. It's a film that it's kind of like trying to do like the similar kind of dynamic between the main characters. And even though Warren Beatty and Dustin Hoffman are fantastic actors in their own right, 
they just don't have that chemistry. Like it's very clear they just did not get along, and that translates to the film. Sometimes that doesn't, and sometimes it does. And that film would definitely it, it didn't feel like they were buddies, even though they were supposed to be. But this film, like even though we know that Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon are great actors, they need that chemistry to really kind of sell us into the film and to buy their friendship and to take us along in this adventure. And I think that is really like one of the key points of the film that really helped to make the film work for me and why it is considered one of the all time classic comedies. Okay, and I just want to clear something up. Isn't Ishtar supposed to be like one of the worst films ever? Yeah, um, pretty much. Okay, I, I wouldn't go I that just, far. It, it's okay. it has that it has a history, but a lot of people it, it has kind of like a cult following now. Like some people have defended it, mm. so that's kind of a weird history. It, it's one of those films that it was written off when it came out, so it's like it it's not really right to completely dismiss it out front, but it's also like not that good. Yeah. So that's why I, I wouldn't consider it one of the worst ever, but it's cer- it's certainly sort of just a just a just a missed uh, it's, opportunity, yeah. I guess. It, it killed Elaine May's career, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, that's definitely the biggest that that uh, the biggest uh, loss that it produced. But yeah, it's just kind of notorious for being one of the the biggest flops of its time. But now it just kind of like if it came out now, it'd just be like another like King Arthur or whatever. <laughs> well then it's it sounds like this is not a film that will be making the extra milestone selection anytime soon but uh oh god no and it wouldn't be for a few years because right that's 87, 87 88 yeah yeah but okay we, we have another clip of course because we have to sort of get into the decision to cross-dress and how that motivation sort of comes about and before there's any angle with the mobsters because eventually we get the sort of depiction of the St. Valentine's Day massacre, which was a real thing that happened in Chicago in 1929. Oh, yeah. Where people actually died. And it is kind of fascinating that they just kind of joke about it 30 years later. And it's one of those things where, like, by today's standards, it's like the equivalent of, gosh, I don't know, what's something crazy that happened 30 years ago? Nothing's coming to mind. But, you know, something like Tiananmen Square. It's like doing a a movie where, like, you're just parroting that or something. But regardless um 30 years ago like the challenger explosion the challenger explosion would be a great example yeah i don't mean great as in that was a great thing that happened yeah so no, I know, my yeah. Basis. yeah but yeah so this is a scene where they're sort of in the jam where they maybe have an option to maybe get a new gig but it would require some changes here's a clip long distance get me the william morris agency in new york well you need a base in the sacks don't you the instruments are right but you're not I want to speak to Mr. Morris. Wait a minute, what's wrong with us? You're the wrong shape. Goodbye. The wrong shape? What are you looking for? Hunchbacks or something? It's not the backs that worry me. What kind of a band is it anyway? <laughs> you gotta be under 25. We could pass for that. You gotta be blonde. We, we could dye our hair. And you gotta be girl. We could no, we couldn't. I <laughs> love that scene so much. And especially because uh, it's it, it dives into another thing that I think is so fantastic about some like it hot is the setups. And the payoffs are so effective yes. because that is perfectly setting up the best punchline of the entire movie, in my opinion. Again, we'll have to get to that later. But uh, yeah. yeah, so so Sam, in terms of the cross-dressing itself, obviously after this happens, they witness the massacre. They're trying to get away from these mobsters. And very quickly through good editing, we just jump right to the part where they have changed and they've transformed completely. What do you think of this transformation? Do you buy it? Uh, in, in what way? Like, would I, would I believe that they are women if I saw them? I mean, I don't think you could, get, you have to guess that far, <laughs> but in terms yeah. of, yeah, their screen presence and, and when this moment happens, because it is a turn, it's a moment when the movie becomes something kind of more in a lot of ways. Yeah. I, I would imagine that in those initial couple of screenings, this is sort of the moment that would make everyone be like, what, what is going on here? What is this movie? And I think it is. It's interesting because we see them, they have somehow acquired all of these, uh, uh, these women's clothing and all this makeup and stuff. And but without money. something, <laughs> what's that? Without any money. <laughs> without any money. Yeah. That's the weird thing. Like it just, they just happen upon it. I, I guess. think they imply uh, that they steal it because there is a scene later where Tony Curtis's character steals a bunch of clothes. So maybe that's how you have to explain it away, but who knows? That's true. The 1929 version of a uh, goodwill or something. But regardless of that, it's interesting because at first we see them just sort of ready to ready to go on this journey, so to speak, to get away from the mob. And obviously they see Marilyn Monroe. They're very enamored by her in in however many ways. And it's it's one of the funniest things about that movie is seeing them sort of learn 
what it's like to be women, essentially, yeah. or at least socially, at least, because everyone, the funniest thing about this movie is that everyone buys completely that they are women. They don't mm-hmm. really, they don't notice their, their masculine calves or anything, which I think is very funny. Right. Yeah. But Sugar makes, even is like, oh, wow, you're just so muscular and it's completely buys it. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of hilarious. It's from lugging around this giant bass guitar. Right, right? Yeah. <laughs> this bull fiddle. Uh, yeah, yes. I, oh, bull fiddle. That's what they were saying. I was wondering what that word was. But yeah, I think the, the one thing uh, with that clip that you just played that I think speaks to a lot of the comedy of this movie is its use of dramatic irony, which in case you don't know, is when the viewer knows something that one of the characters doesn't. And in this case, what we know is that they're actually men just dressed as women. But none of the characters except for Joe and Jerry know that. And so it makes for a lot of very funny situations, seeing certain things almost happen that might compromise their entire plan. It's certainly a, it's certainly a shift that moment, that, that edit. And I think it's very funny. It, it, I laughed out loud at it, but it's, it is really the moment where in essence, the movie sort of begins or at least the comedy yeah. uh, part of it begins. I, I love the structure of this movie so much. I love that it also makes me laugh out loud so many times. But even just because the first part when they're on the train, and we'll play a quick clip of that in a moment, but when they're on the train, they're sort of, at least Jack Lemmon's character, enjoying this this ability to blend in because most of the characters sure, are around yeah. other women. But then later on, the film sort of adds more information, and then they have to experience what it's like to be a woman in a man's world more directly, <laughs> and they have to experience all the drawbacks of that. And the film just keeps going on and on, adding more funny things to the plot to keep it funny. You know, there's a there's another transformation that happens later that is so great at keeping this two hour film just moving along quickly and easily. But w- what about you, Will? Do you, do you think the cross dressing in this works? And did you laugh as much as Sam and I did? Uh, well, just talking about the intro. I mean, I I, I don't want to bring up all of uh, Dustin Hoffman's films, but it did remind me a decent bit of Tootsie. I had to believe that that movie was fairly inspired by this oh, one yeah. right absolutely yeah. i mean i don't think the transition is quite as stark as it is in that one i remember it kind of that one like they intentionally like kind of like, cut real quick to like make it a little more i guess uh dramatic or not dramatic uh you could also but, mention mrs doubtfire for sure yeah yeah but i, I know like uh with tootsie oh yeah i guess yeah you're right yeah with mrs doubtfire too but um, that's I, I think that came to mind. I, I definitely was I was watching the film. I could see a lot of like the films that uh, inspired this or TV shows or anything like uh, Bosom Buddies and stuff like that. <laughs> Boy Meets uh, World be- has a great episode. I think it's Girl Like Me that gets right into this. Yeah. Yeah. But um, to answer your question, though, I, I do think especially now, like there's kind of like a fine line when you like uh, you do comedy like this where it could go into offensive territory or it could go the wrong way but i think it's really a credit to the film that they don't really push that far into the wrong side like they they're able to transition i think it's mainly for the reasons you point out like all the characters buy into it like there's not there's not a lot of comedy directed so much towards that but so much like the plights of the characters themselves and what they're trying to do and so i i think it really works yeah i was really surprised by that Let's talk about Marilyn Monroe, because this is about the time in the movie where she is introduced. And when I was rewatching this, too, I was kind of wondering to myself, because I I had that same feeling you did, Will, where I was like, when does this movie really start? Because Marilyn Monroe is not in it yet. But of course, we are introduced to her. She is the ukulele playing lead singer of the band, which I play the ukulele as well. So I obviously have a big crush on Marilyn Monroe, like everyone else who's ever watched one of her movies. But yeah, this is a quick clip. It's one of the first moments where they interact with her and they get to know her a little bit. And wouldn't you know it, it's the Prohibition era and some bourbon falls out or they catch her drinking some bourbon. The bourbon falling out happens later. Oh my. Yeah. So (laughs) here's that clip. It's on the train sequence. Terribly sorry. It's okay. I was scared it was sweet soup. You won't tell anybody, will you? Tell what? Well, if they catch me once more, they're going to kick me out of the band. You the replacement for the bass and sax? That's us. And I'm Daphne. Uh, This is uh, uh, Joe Zavine. Hello. I'm Sugar Cane. Hi. Sugar Cane? Yeah, I changed. It used to be Sugar Kowalczyk. Polish? Yes. I come from this musical family. My mother is a piano teacher and my father was a conductor. Where did he conduct? On the Baltimore and Ohio. 
Oh. I play the ukulele and I sing, too. Sings, too? <laughs> well, I don't have much of a voice, but then this isn't much of a band, either. I'm only with them because I'm running away. Running away from what? Oh, don't get me started on that. Hey, you want some? It's bourbon. <laughs> I'll take a rain check. <laughs> I want you to think I'm a drinker. I can stop any time I want to, only I don't want to, especially when I'm blue. We understand. All the girls drink. It's just that I'm the one that gets caught. Story of my life. I always get the fuzzy end of the lollipop. All right. Four things on what just happened. <laughs> I love that yes. conductor line. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I just have four things. First of all, Jack Lemon is leaning so much into this we have to point out that once <laughs> yeah, yeah. he becomes daphne this this is one of the first scenes where he really leans into it it's just it's tremendous it's so well written it's so over the top and it's perfect because tony curtis is playing it so much calmer you know he talked about how he was channeling grace kelly and his mother when doing this role and that brings me to the second thing which that's not really his voice most of the movie. They had to dub over it because Tony Curtis had such a hard time doing a high voice. Yeah, so they got another male actor to do a fake woman's voice, and that's usually what you're hearing with Mm. Curtis there. Another thing, I didn't realize these two things until this new rewatch. First of all, that sugar is clearly a reference to eye candy. I didn't catch that (laughs) before. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then the second thing was that this was supposed to be funny. She's the ditzy blonde stereotype. And so the fact that she's Polish is only supposed to elicit the dumb Polish stereotype, which I never really caught before because that's some more historical context. And I I don't know how I feel about that because it's pretty offensive. (laughs) But I'm sure at the time, I mean, people probably found that hilarious because that's just a stereotype that was relished in back then. Yeah, I mean, the dizziness doesn't quite work, I think, as well this time. But, I mean, I don't know if it kills a movie by any stretch of the imagination. Fifth thing. I love the part where Marilyn Monroe says, story of my life. It's so meta. You know, we kind of talked about it before, but... At this point in her career, she's gone through a lot. She's gone through really the peak of her success. And she's in the middle of trying to reinvent herself as a more serious actress. She had a lot of problems with doing this film in black and white because most of the comedies in those days were becoming colorized and black and white was becoming more of a dated thing. But they had to do black and white. Billy Wilder famously was like, this has to be black and white. It's not a drama. It's not, it's not double indemnity or sunset Boulevard. But he wanted the cross-dressing to be more convincing. And apparently the makeup wasn't as convincing unless it was in black and white. And he somehow convinced Marilyn to do this. But she was in the middle of studying method acting. And she was studying ways to sort of transcend this dumb blonde stereotype. And you can see in this scene and a few others where she's almost sort of winking at the camera. Like, I know this role is wanting me to be stupid. (laughs) And she's sort of saying like, story of my life. This is kind of what I have to deal with. But what what do you guys think about that? Do you think, you know, Sam, do you think that's fair? What do you think she's trying to do here? Well, I wasn't, uh, I'm not actually aware of a lot of the stuff you're saying. I've never heard of this Polish stereotype. Is, is, was that a thing in the late fifties? It was a thing throughout most of the 20th century. Yeah. The dumb really? Polak. Yeah. 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 That was, huh. that's, that's very thing, unfortunate. Yeah. 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 Really? I mean, it's not, we agree with it, but it is a thing. Like it, it is, it is yes. curious. Yeah. Gotta be clear about that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've never heard of that before. So I can't really speak to that, but what I can speak to is uh, sort of what you're talking about, which is that sort of meta element. And it's all the more tragic knowing that she wouldn't even go on to live that much longer. But yeah, this is a movie that sort of, at the end of the day, does sort of play on, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not necessarily ignorance, but sort of inability of the majority of its characters to sort of see what's right in front of them. You know what I'm saying? And so that certainly could be a problematic element. I hadn't thought about that before. But yeah, I might need to give that a little bit more thought. Well, I was just going to say that I, I was going to mention this earlier, but I could, even without knowing the details about the miscarriage, you could kind of tell there's like a melancholy to the performance. Yeah. 
like just the way that she says some of her lines, there's like a, I think, unintended sadness. But I think that ultimately benefits the performance because I think when she says stuff like, I'm not so bright, it's not like she's saying she's dumb, just like she's kind of hopeful. She wants her life to be better at this point. She says she's like about 25, like a quarter of a century. So she knows that like she wants things to kind of like progress into a point where she's like in a married life and stable and finds the man of her dreams. And like every time that she falls out of love, it, it, it comes even more heartbreaking, not because she doesn't expect it, but she has, but because she wants things to actually work out that time. And to me, I think that's why the performance really works. Yeah, it's almost like she's internalizing a characterization that's been put on her by other right. people. And rather than it being a self-deprecating thing, I think she's just sort of being like, yeah, this is how people think of me. And it's almost like she's trying to own it. And it is a fascinating flair that she puts on the character. I'm glad Will mentioned the word uh, melancholy. I think there is a melancholy to this movie that I didn't pick up on the first time, specifically with sort of the time period. There was that clip you played, the first clip, I believe, where um, they were saying, like, suppose the, you know, suppose the stock market crashes or uh, suppose that so and so happens or I forget all the all the examples. But it is this is right on the verge of the Great Depression, which we yeah. discussed at length last time. And, and so the roaring I, 20s. The Roaring Twenties, exactly. So I think it's very interesting to see this sort of loose, freeing comedy where just sort of all sorts of things happen and no one really no one really has like any sort of concrete plan or anything. And how that can be sort of demoralizing in a lot of ways. There are just there are moments where it's like, yeah, we just sort of gotta deal with what we got. Hell, the whole movie's about <laughs> about dressing as women to try to make ends meet and escape the the evil gangsters. So I do think that's very important. And I think it's, it's worth mentioning. Absolutely. Could not agree more. I, I think that <clears throat> this movie in a lot of ways is about change and it's about a time period that's on the brink of change. It's about characters who have to literally change themselves. But then also you have two very distinctive character arcs, uh, three actually, when you think about it, mm. where Jack Lemon is sort of changing into the sort of person who, as we'll talk about, really embraces this this idea of being a woman <laughs> swept off her feet. And Tony Curtis's character embraces changing his ways. He's clearly the character who has the most work to do in his personality because, like we mentioned, he's got a gambling problem. He's a womanizer. And his sort of budding romance with Sugar, as it were, could be something that inspires him to change a few things about him aside from the thing, the way that he looks and everything like that. And then also Sugar yeah. changes too in this movie, as we'll talk about, because she's somebody who, when we first meet her, like you said, she just wants to have a secure, stable life and she has a, a weakness for saxophone players. Another thing that I really like, though, about the dynamic between these three characters is as you watch it, you don't really know who the romantic lead is going to be because there are, you start off with the Jack Lemon character trying to seduce Sugar and then it sort of changes to, oh no, okay, so Tony Curtis is the one who is going to be falling for her in a real way and and somehow Jack Lemon he just sort of relents eventually. But in one of the, <laughs> the the movie's funniest scenes, one of its best sequences, honestly, is they're still on the train, it's overnight, and Jack Lemmon's character is sleeping in bed and all of a sudden Sugar comes up into his bunk to thank him for covering <laughs> for her during rehearsal. And uh, here's here's a little clip of him trying to deal with that. Clearly an uncomfortable situation considering Marilyn Monroe's unbelievably gorgeous appeal. So here's that clip. Yeah. <laughs> I can pretend we were lost in a dark game. We're trying to find our way out. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty interesting. <laughs> Anything wrong? No, no, no. Not a thing. The poor thing, you're trembling all over. It's ridiculous. Your head's hot. It's ridiculous. You got cold feet. Isn't that ridiculous? Here, let me warm up a little. Mm -hmm. there. Isn't that better? Yes, I'm a girl, I'm a girl, I'm a girl. What'd you say? I'm, I'm a very sick girl. Oh, I better go before I catch something. I'm not that sick. I've got very low resistance. Well, oh, that sugar. If you feel that you're coming down with something, my dear, the best thing in the world is a shot of whiskey. You got some? I don't know where to get it. <laughs> don't move. It is so hard listening to that without <laughs> laughing. <laughs> I'm literally oh my holding God. myself back. Yeah. You know, this is a this is something, and this goes along with that the third clip that you played too. Jack Lemon's performance in this is so 
amazing to me because it works on a variety of levels. At first, it works because you can tell that this is his way of sort of living out this adolescent fantasy mm-hmm. of living within mm-hmm. an air quote woman's world, you know, without being the one odd one in the room, so to speak. And this is this this whole sequence, which eventually just grows and grows and uh, ultimately becomes this massive like slumber party, essentially. You could just see the 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 realization and the the horror that he experiences realizing that, oh yeah, no, this isn't just like a fun thing I get to do. This this has real <laughs> this has real ramifications. <laughs> and just even just listening to the discomfort in his voice is is amazing to me and I love they it. They literally start tickling him. <laughs> it's just <laughs> you feel how everything has changed. His entire perception of the situation has changed. I was going to say, I don't know how that bed didn't break, though, and kill poor Tony <laughs> Curtis, but I, that's the movies, I suppose. They, they right. build them strong. I they think they said to, you know? it took them like six hours to film all of the scenes in the bed, and so they were they were interviewing some of the women who were there, and they were just... They, they were talking about how uncomfortable it was, how insane it was, and you know, because you have Marilyn Monroe in the mix, and it, it is one of the scene's best films. Just from a technical level, the fact that they were able to pull off that shot, I mean, you have 13 people all crammed in one little tiny bed. <laughs> I think you said scene's best films. Yeah, you did. Scenes, I didn't want to say anything. but That's yeah. true, too, though. <laughs> it's one of the scene's best films, and that is something oh, like yes. it, huh? So after of the this- various films in that scene, that one is probably the best. <laughs> that's right. It does feel like that. But yeah, so- th- Lots of great scenes are happening, of course, in on the train, but I, I think it is pretty pitch perfect in the timing when they get you off the train and we finally visit the beach in Miami. They get their hotel rooms, and this is really where the plot kicks into a new gear. I sort of think of it as the the car, they're like in a car. The film is a car and it's stick. And you have the first gear, which is like the setup, the second gear, which is where things get a little you know, they're pumping it up a bit. This is the third <laughs> gear of the film. This is when it's getting faster, tighter, and they're, they're adding new things to the plot to keep it fresh. Because if they just kept both of these characters in drag throughout, I think it could have gotten pretty stale pretty fast. But they have the ingenious idea to change everything up because at this point, Tony Curtis's character has figured out a way he can seduce Sugar. And of course, he can't do that as a woman. He has to change into another character. But in terms of the beach scenes... Will, what what stuck out to you about this stuff? I mean, was there anything here that uh, as you were watching it in full, were you kind of feeling that? Like, were you feeling the pacing of the film at this point? A little bit, yeah. I mean, I I was wondering at that point, like, where are they going to go from here? What's going to happen? And then when uh, Tony Curtis assumes his second identity in the film, I guess, would that be his third identity in the film, technically? Yeah, sure. Uh, Yeah, um, I was watching it and I was like, "Um, this kind of reminds me of somebody the same way that when we were watching it happened when night last month i was like this reminds me of somebody his his other persona and then i looked on the amazon prime trivia and i i realized that he was playing uh a parody or an impersonation of uh cary grant yeah uh, have you guys heard this which is so <laughs> funny it's yeah and it, he said it's a billy wilder and he that was one of the improvisations i was talking about where that wasn't in the script but it was tony curtis's idea because he thought that it would be funny and he thought it would add something to it and billy wilder was like sure go for it and it's just a good example of improvising without changing the jokes as they're written but adding like a little bit of a flair to the joke written to make it his own yeah mm-hmm yeah, and I guess when uh, Cary Grant saw the film and the performance, he was like, I guess he quipped something along the lines of, uh, I don't sound like that. So, <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, no, I, I, I think I agree with you, John. I think that scene, cause kind of, that scene does kind of redeem the film a little bit in the sense that, like, at, at that point, that's kind of like a make or break moment where it could have dragged or could have, like, fallen to the wayside a bit. And I think that's a credit to... Bill Wilder or Billy Wilder's uh, genius as a screenwriter. Bill yeah, that's like, that's like, I know. Well, I know him because I'm the producer of the film. Obviously, there you go. And, right, that's uh, right. Yeah, you help fi- <laughs> you finance this thing. You can call him right. You want. Yeah, Bill right, Wilder yeah, yeah. and Bill. Oh, Action. you know, Bill Wilder and I, we go back. Um, yeah. Ian so, Diamond. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ew, but um, ew. no, I was just gonna say I think it's a credit to his uh, talents as a screenwriter and director at that point. Absolutely, and because you mentioned Cary Grant, it is kind of funny that last month we talked about it happened one night and Sam Nolan, you mentioned Arsenic and Old Lace, the Frank Capra movie, which of course stars Cary Grant. So nice little connection there. Nice. But okay. We finally get to probably, I don't, I wouldn't say this is my favorite scene, but I do think 
Um, it's not the funniest scene, but it's one of my favorite character scenes. It, it's the scene for me where I started to really like Sugar. And that is when Sugar meets this millionaire yacht owning persona invented by, I keep forgetting, is it Joe slash Josephine, whatever. But yeah. he he's all dressed up as the sailor. He stole the clothes, as we mentioned earlier. He's reading a newspaper and he trips her character to try to get her attention, but then he acts very aloof. Here is how they meet. Haven't I seen you somewhere before? Not very likely. You staying at the hotel? Not at all. The face is familiar. Possible you've seen it in the newspapers or magazines, um, Vanity Fair. That must be it. Would you mind moving just a little, please? You're blocking my view. Your view of what? They run up a red and white flag on the up and it's time for cocktail. You own a yacht? Which one is it? The big one? Certainly not. With all the unrest in the world, I don't think anybody should have a yacht that sleeps more than 12. I quite agree. Tell me, who runs up that flag? Your wife? No, my flags do it. Who mixes the cocktails? Your wife? No, my cocktails <laughs> do it. Look, if you're interested in whether I am married or not... Oh, I'm not interested at all. Well, I'm not. That's very interesting. <laughs> How's the stock market? Up, up, up. I bet while we were talking you made like $100,000? Could be. Uh, you play the market? No, the ukulele. And I sing, too. For your own amusement? A bunch of us girls are appearing at the hotel. Sweet Sue and her society syncopated. Oh, your society girl. Oh, yes, quite. You know, Bryn Moore, Vassar. We're just doing this for a lark. Syncopators. Does that mean you play that very fast music, uh, jazz? Yeah, real hot. Oh, well, I guess some like it hot. I personally prefer classical music. Ah, there it is, the title of the film. Uh -huh. So as it, of course, it's a double meaning. Some Like It Hot is a reference to the jazz, which is of this time period. But of course, you know, sex appeal as well. But I have to yeah. say, this is the scene where the film is kind of saved for me because up until this point, you're like, this poor woman is being taken advantage of by Tony Curtis gallivanting as Cary Grant. But as you see in this scene, she's a human being who has the capability to lie and sort of present herself as another thing. So it sort of changes di the dynamic, which it reminds me of Breakfast at Tiffany's, where you have two characters who are sort of both very imperfect and who sort of both have agency in terms of the things that they do to sort of get what they want. And that's where it clicked for me. I was like, this is a good romance. And it's, to me, and this is my opinion, I think it's a better play on the romance that we see it and happen one night. If we're going to compare two films that are obviously kind of connected, uh, not just by their release dates. But w what do you think about this one, Sam? Uh, well, I don't know if that's entirely necessary to, to compare apples to oranges, John, but I think you're absolutely right. I think this scene, not only does it introduce a whole nother comedic layer of dramatic irony, which makes for a lot of funny situations, uh, you're right, it also does add that dimension to Sugar's character, and side note, it's it, I don't know if you guys thought the same, but while I was listening to that, I thought Tony Curtis sounded a little bit like a young Michael Caine. Did, could you hear that a little bit? <laughs> I, I think that's uh, your bias for English accents. It could be, yeah. But it'd be yeah, funny if it's young, young Michael Caine and Sugar Caine, so it's perfect. Um, uh, there, you, That's why you wanted to say that. Right? Uh, I promise it wasn't, but... <laughs> but just, yeah. just go with it, Sam. Don't... <laughs> Yeah, I was uh, taken, I think, more by Marilyn's performance listening back to it just because I think as we were talking about earlier, like you, you said that was one of the scenes that they filmed early on in the filming, right? Yeah, it was like one of the very first. Yeah. And you could just see how like like full of life and energy she is and then just like to know what would happen just kind of uh, it, it informs the later scenes or other scenes in the film. But yeah, I, I do think it works for all the reasons you guys said. Yeah, we haven't mentioned it yet, but... Besides these scenes, Marilyn was really difficult to work with on the set. A lot of her scenes are in the hotel, of course. And they I think there was one scene where they did about 80 takes because she kept saying her lines wrong. And they said one of the big problems with her in this film was that she kept showing up late and not just forgetting her lines, but I mean, because that can be fixed. But she was just having a lot of trouble and just wasn't able to do the scenes on the director's time. And it, it created a lot of problems. And I was thinking about this, of like this movie still works so well, despite having such a significant handicap, right? Where clearly 
you, you need the timing to be perfect, the jokes to be perfect, mm -hmm. but they had to do so many takes. I can't imagine being Tony Curtis or Jack Lemmon in this movie. These actors had to get it perfect every single time because if they didn't, that was it, you know, because they had to get it perfect every time because the one time Marilyn would get it, that was the scene that they went with. Mm. Well, they are professionals, John. <laughs> all of them were professionals. I know. Course. That's what I meant. They, they're all professionals. Yes. All right. So there, there's a lot more that happens in this movie. We could go on and on. The, the mobsters come back, of course. There's a pretty extended seduction scene where Sugar, of course, is trying is the one who is seducing the, the yacht. I don't think we ever get his name, do we? The guy who owns the yacht. I and mean, that's probably the point. But we do meet another Oops. character named Osgood, who yes. hits on Daphne, Jack Lemmon's character, from the get-go. And it's a nice little subplot that comes later in the film. But of all of these scenes, as we get closer to the end, Sam, what stuck out for you? What you were just talking about with where Marilyn Monroe's lay, I had never thought about this before, but I think that actually does add a little bit more to her character. It's almost it's uh, it's almost as if that one, uh, what, what was the line in the train where she sort of just recognizes how others look at her and is like, yeah, all right, see, fine. Not very bright. Yeah, exactly. That's the one. And uh, she's like, fine, then I'll be who I am and you're just going to have to deal with it, I guess. So I think that adds another layer. I'd love to watch it again with that in mind. I think it's funny how this movie, which is so focused on dialogue and like double meanings and situational and dramatic irony and stuff. It's funny that it devolves into sort of a zany chase scene <laughs> towards the end. <laughs> right. It's like a Benny Hill chase scene and it's hilarious. And cause, cause it the is. stakes are so high. I mean, we sort of glossed over it, but there's like a serious crime movie happening in the background of this film. A big stretch <laughs> of it doesn't have the mobsters at all, but we see people just get massacred. Like we see it happen. These people get shot. Yeah. But that just raises the stakes even higher and it makes you feel like anything could happen, right? And so when the chase is happening, you actually feel the tension. And it, I just think it's very well constructed. It's so It would have been so easy for them to make it slapsticky, for, for George Raft and Pat O'Brien to play it a little goofier. And in general, they could have played it goofier. They could have, been, they could have made Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis wear more over-the-top dresses, right? But I think the genius of the cinematography combined with the script is that it is a little bit toned down in appearance so that the jokes are the things that shine. And th that's where this yeah. movie succeeds ultimately as a comedy, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it is. It's also interesting to note how uh, I think one of us alluded to it earlier, how Joe, Tony Curtis, is kind of a scumbag, really. Like mm -hmm. so the methods that he uses in numerous scenes are sort of a sort of devious. So it is it is also very satisfying to see all of those plans sort of come crashing down in various ways. I love that. And I don't want to jump ahead or anything, but are we going to mention the, the final line of the movie? We will eventually. But first, I want okay. to bring it to you, Will. The seduction scene where, because uh, related to that note, what what was your read on this whole thing where it, it is kind of a weird, manipulative, kind of gross thing where Tony Curtis's character is basically hyper aloof <laughs> in a way to seduce this woman? Does it work for you or did you feel kind of uncomfortable? Where, where are you at with that whole sequence? You're talking about the boat scene, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean... It doesn't not work, but I'd say of all the scenes of the film, this is like kind of where it was losing me a little bit. I don't know. It, it goes on for a fairly long amount of time. It's like, like 10 minutes of the film or something like that. And uh, I mean, it's not bad, but yeah, I, I, it didn't win me over as much as the rest of the film did, I'd say. Yeah, it's it's got a few really funny lines toward the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. With the, the herring in the glass jar, it was pretty funny. The closet space, I mean, there's funny stuff. I do like the editing trick they do to sort of break that scene oh, up. Oh, yeah, yeah, it yeah. slides over to Jack Lemmon doing the tango. And again, so he's gone on this date with Osgood, even though Osgood like, basically sexually harassed him in the elevator. But he's right. doing it because... Joe tells him to, and this dynamic just becomes where you, you have, because there's, we didn't mention it too, but there's a part where the Jack Lemon character is hoping that Tony's character gets caught, right? And he's trying to like get sugar to catch him switching characters as it were. And then at some point though, he gives up and he's all, he's team. It's, it's like if uh, Jacob became team Edward, right? Like in the first <laughs> Twilight movie, that's kind of what we're talking about here. 
You, you appreciate that reference, Sam? Yeah, because it's such a weird thing to compare Twilight to Some Like It Hot and, and to insinuate that Jacob would suddenly completely switch sides. I'm just that trying was, to connect with our younger, hipper audience. If that's I hope it you. works. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I think you're right on, Will, that this scene doesn't work as well as it probably should for, for reasons that seem pretty clear. But okay, let's, let's get into the engaged scene. Now this one, again, another, I keep saying they're all my favorite. That's because they are, but (laughs) this is the night after. And it's sort of implied that Joe has slept with sugar at this point. And he comes back up to the hotel room at dawn. There's another weird thing where a lot of these scenes are supposed to be happening at night, but because of the black and white and the way they shot them, it doesn't look like it's nighttime, but that's just another little minor nitpick. You just sort of have to go with it because you, I mean, think about it. It's black and white. If it's too dark, you, you mm-hmm. can't see anything. And these are a lot of exterior shots. But anyway, we digress. This scene is when Joe goes up to the hotel room and he finds Daphne slash Jerry playing the maracas, which we'll talk about why that was put in there. And he's got a little bit of news for his friend. Here we go. What happened? I'm engaged. Congratulations. Who's the lucky girl? I am. <laughs> <laughs> What? Osgood proposed to me. We're planning a June wedding. (laughs) What are you talking about? You can't marry Osgood. You think he's too old for me? Jerry, you can't be serious. Why not? He keeps marrying girls all the time. But you're not a girl, you're a guy. And why would a guy want to marry a guy? Security. Jerry, you better lie down. You're not well. Will you stop treating me like a child? I'm not stupid. I know there's a problem. I'll say there is. His mother. We need her approval. But I'm not (laughs) worried because I don't smoke. (laughs) Jerry, there's another problem. Like what? Like what are you going to do on your honeymoon? We've been discussing that. He wants to go to the Riviera, but I kind of lean towards Niagara Falls. (laughs) Okay, so two things. First just of all, two. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say just two. Just two. Well, I want to leave it to you guys. I don't want to take it all. Two things. I I definitely love how a lot of these scenes are master scenes. They're one takes where the, all of this is happening. There's no cuts, and the timing is perfect. The acting is perfect. They are able to do a lot of scenes like this when Sugar isn't in them. But even the ones where Sugar is in them, they they manage to do a few with her that it's just one take. But this one works so well because the energy never fades away. And that goes to my second thing, which I didn't know this until I was rewatching this and doing a little bit extra research. This might be in your x-ray trivia, Will Ashen. But the maracas that Lemon is using in this scene were intentionally put there and worked into the script by Wilder because he was so sure, and you can probably tell by the way we were laughing, that people needed pauses in between the jokes because they're so funny. And it's so hard not to laugh. So he anticipated that there needed to be these scenes where Lemon is doing something with the maracas so the audience can laugh and not miss the next joke, which I I love. I I just think that's such a confidence because we've all seen that movie where there's a pause for laughter and it's dead silence and nobody laughs. laughs. And that's always, that's not fun for anyone. I just dearly love Jack Lemon's just unabashed enthusiasm in this scene and i think there's a very uh a very interesting undertone to this scene that maybe is a little bit more obvious watching it now where jack lemon has sort of or jerry rather has sort of completely accepted his identity as daphne and it, there there are a few different ways to interpret that especially with joe's reaction but ultimately i think this ends up working best as what it's meant to be which is just as sort of a an exaggerated comedy and just sort of the exasperation of joe and just the pure euphoria <laughs> that jerry's feeling <laughs> in this moment of oh i'm so i've never been happier in my life you could just you could just tell and jack lemon does it perfectly so i really i, I love this scene a lot too the only thing I was just going to say real quick is that, like, I, I know we were talking earlier about the film was able to kind of escape uh, some of the restrictions of the code. But I do like the movie in, like, scenes like this kind of follows it in order to fit, like, with the, the late 20s. So, like, that scene, like, they obviously don't point out, like, the elephant in the room, but they are able to cleverly kind of avoid it in a way that, you know, makes it really good in a comedic sense and stuff. And I, I really appreciate that from the scene. Which is a good 
tie up to, because on that note, the actual ending of the film is probably also its funniest and its most controversial. Now, from here, of course, we have all the mobster stuff. They're back and it's all yeah. funny. The it's mobster all sort of just randomly show up at the hotel which it's I so think is contrived a little... it's so yeah. yeah it's like oh they just happen to be going to this friend's italian opera and they also Did, get um, murdered yeah did anyone else kind of forget about the mobsters until this point <laughs> or is that just me i had a moment uh, where i was like not completely but it is sort of bizarre you get the sense that we're like all right we gotta have the mobster show up at the hotel how uh, uh some italian opera or something <laughs> like I, that that's probably the one plot element that seems a little perfunctory to me but that's if that's the movie's only problem then it's great right since it's a comedy you can sort of laugh off a lot of these issues uh these script issues yeah. because they're not the point like the point isn't the mobster subplot it's not supposed to be good <laughs> it's just supposed to be there also, to make for motivation i mean at this point you know it's a comedy it's also pushing like the two hour mark at this point so it's kind of like yeah you know like, yeah. even though it's very good it's like yeah you kind of want this to wrap up pretty soon because you don't want it to drag on too long so you kind of excuse they kind of like yeah, yeah that, that, there you go right on so, right yeah, on that's how i feel well at the risk of this episode of cinema Alex, extra milestone i was literally just gonna say that <laughs> going too long we have one last clip I'm sorry, we had to do it. There's no way that we can yeah. talk about Some Like It Hot without talking about the ending scene, which uh, it was, we didn't really talk about it, but this film, or did we mention the AFI? Uh, uh, no, we did not actually. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. So this was in the top 100 uh, best American films of all time and the top 100 best comedies of all time. It was the number one in, I believe, the year 2000. And in 98, it was the number 14 best movie. But in, I think also in the year 2000, it had the number 48, I want to say. I don't know how I know this. Um, best, most <laughs> memorable quotes. And hmm. that is I, the I quote also, from this scene. I, I, I also happen to know, just real quick, that there's Empire Magazine 10 years ago did a list of the top 500 movies of all time. It made number 27. So highly revered by many publications. As it should be. Now, at this point in the story, we're getting close to the ending. And Spats Columbo is dead at this point. But some of the gangsters are still alive because they, of course, witnessed the murder of the gangsters they were just trying to get away from. And so they're, <laughs> they're trying to escape. They get back into Crossdress. And at one point, Joe sees Marilyn Monroe performing goes up to her, kisses her in his drag. She realizes who it is because they like apparently made out all night. And mm -hmm. there is kind of a very funny part where everyone in the audience is like, lesbians? <laughs> and it's very funny. <laughs> if you and, look at the background of that scene, it's so funny. None of the band members are right. even <laughs> acknowledging it. They're like, this is I like fine. the one... Like the one, like uh, I think she's like a flute or a trumpet player. Like kind of looks up, it's like oh, that's strange, and he's like still playing the music and stuff. Yeah, they're so <laughs> professional, they can't yeah. even. That's react Brooklyn. To it. <laughs> hey, it's Florida, but you know. yeah, it's Florida. Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> well, still, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's very funny. And but yes, of course, Sugar realizes at this point that she, the per the man that she loves, is a saxophone player. They have that effect on her. And she follows them out as they escape to Osgood's yacht. He, of course, has the boat ready to go. And Daphne tells him, oh, this is my bridesmaid. Oh, and my other bridesmaid. And we have that he says little... flower girl, right? Oh, that's Does right. The like... second one is the flower girl. Yes. Uh, he corrects. He corrects him, of course. But, of co but then, yes, Sugar gets on the boat. And we have one final moment where Tony Curtis and Marilyn Monroe have their, oh, I'm no good for you, babe, that kind of thing, tying up loose ends. But it's really mm -hmm. to get to the film's true <laughs> final moment. We're actually going to play it right to when the credits roll. So here, here is that infamous scene. It has gone down as one of my favorite scenes of all time. Uh, all you see is a front camera shot. Osgood is on the left and Joe, or sorry, Daphne is on the right. And you just have to picture Osgood's unwavering, <laughs> grinny <laughs> smile. And it's just so nonchalant and ca casual. Here is the clip. Yeah, Osgood, I can't get married in your mother's dress. <laughs> uh, she and I, we are not built the same way. We can have it altered. Yeah, I know you don't. That's good. I'm going to level with you. We can't get married at all. Why not? Well, in the first place, I'm not a natural blonde. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. I smoke. I smoke all the time. I don't care. Well, I have a terrible past. For three years now, I've been living with a saxophone player. I forgive you. I can never have children. We can adopt some. But you don't understand, Osgood. <laughs> uh, 
I'm a man. Well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> oh. That's what? the funniest joke in movie <laughs> history. I can't even think of one that the I like better than that. Joke. It has everything. It's it's the perfect <laughs> setup and payoff. It's it's the perfect punchline because it's so simple, but it's such a surprise. Because you think, of course, that he's going to freak out. There's going to be an explosion. But yeah. no, <laughs> it's a perfect subversion. You know what I noticed, too? I never even noticed it while watching it. But listening to it, I realized the music is building to that punchline. I never even yeah. noticed that before. It's sort of escalating slowly with each uh, with each justification that gets shunted off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> We can adopt some. We, I, it's yes. just perfect delivery from both Osgood and Daphne. Like the, the both actors are just, it's just pitch perfect. And I, I, it's crazy to me that this was a placeholder line that nobody's perfect because they were like, ah, we'll come up with something better later. And no, they, they ended up being like, ah, they didn't come up with anything else. And I think one of, I think I.L. Diamond was the one who wrote it and he kind of fought for it and was like, no, no, this is the one you need to do because they didn't think it was funny enough. Clearly it was. But Will Ashton, I'm going to assume by your silence that you, you only think it's, it's okay. I was just being respectful. I, I didn't even know if my uh, thing was on or off. But um, no, I mean, I, I, I think by now, like, even if you have only a fleeting understanding of the film, that you probably know that line or that joke. I mean, that which does kind of rob it of its, of its power, unfortunately, a little bit. But I still think it's a credit to the line that it still it's funny. It's just like a funny line altogether. And I, I don't know if I'm quite... Uh, as willing to go as high as Sam was as far as uh, its place in comedy history. But uh, I mean, it deserves that place in uh, its famous line history for sure. Yeah, I cannot watch this scene without laughing out loud. I've never been able to do it. And I've literally watched this clip on YouTube. I don't know how many times. So <laughs> I, I understand the enthusiasm. It's it's pretty great. But that is some Like It Hot, very funny movie. Let's kind of wrap this up with our just kind of our general what do we think of it now? Now that we've watched it a few times, we've talked about it, uh, starting with you, Will Ashin, how about it? Yeah, I mean, like I said at the beginning of the episode, this is my first time seeing it in full. Um, like I've seen bits and pieces, obviously, before, and so I, I knew kind of what to expect from the general plot line of the film or the structure of it, but I wasn't really sure if it was going to work as well as it's been um, accredited or as if it was going to hit the high marks that I was expecting it to and i think it just really works it's a really really solid comedy and i do think there is kind of a timeless quality to it too that you can see the influences for sure i mean we mentioned only a handful of them throughout the episode but i mean it does definitely i think sam even said this at one point uh have probably if not sunset boulevard then this one is probably like the most influential of uh billy wilder's films and film history and it makes sense and it's deserving too and so i'm glad i finally got a chance to cross off my list finally all right what about you sam uh i love it as you could probably tell by by uh all the things i've said i think it's just got everything it's got uh in addition to it just working perfectly as a comedy which it does it's also got just these tremendous character arcs that we've touched upon a whole lot of whole lot of fun aesthetic stuff i love the way the movie looks and i just love that overarching idea of just sort of uh john as you mentioned just sort of change you know just sort of making things work as they come your way. And that's really what life's all about. And uh, I just, I, I have a few problems here and there, but I, I love this movie to pieces. Same here. Yeah. One of my favorite movies of all time. And I mean, that goes for basically every film I've ever seen by Billy Wilder, <laughs> but I do hold this up in like the top of his films. I like it more than sunset Boulevard, double indemnity. Yep. And, but of course the apartment is still my favorite because I'm a hopeless something. And even though this <laughs> film is hilarious, it's, <laughs> I know, I know. Even this this film a is hilarious. Something. It's not the best romance. It just isn't. Sugar works, but the the romance between her and Tony Curtis it doesn't sizzle in the way that mm -mm. it probably wants to. It, it really is a film that works because of the humor and because of the way it looks and because of its time and all the stuff that we've talked about. And for that reason, yeah, definitely one of my favorite comedies of all time. Definitely in like really close to my favorite. And I'm just, I'm glad we were able to talk about it. I've never actually talked about this film in any sort of podcast forum before. So that was fun to do. Now let's talk about what we're going to talk about next Ooh, week, uh, month. Yes. Yes. April, 2019. We have a few options, but I think the one we want to go with, because we had three options that were definitely 
in our minds worth talking about as films. And I did a lot of research to find like April milestones. There weren't a ton to be totally honest, as far as like films yeah. that reach the upper echelons of these three, which I say that. And the first one I'm going to mention, you're gonna be like, say what? And that's mean girls, which celebrates its <laughs> 15th year. But I'm going to say mean girls is a very important film, a very influential film. And I, I enjoy it quite a lot. It's not a classic yeah, I mean- movie, but yeah. It's definitely had a placeholder in pop culture, I think, yeah. for sure. It's too recent, of course, to to rise up to the level of like maybe that sort of extra milestone we've sort of talked about. Yeah, that's but, my one concern is that I just feel right. like, well, in addition to the film being like so prevalent in pop culture to the point where I don't know what we can really say that hasn't already been said. I, I do think, like you're saying, it might be a little too young for this podcast so far. Yeah. Well, well, maybe maybe five years from now we'll consider. It. Maybe, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's right. How is it? How is it going to be fifteen this year? It's fifteen this year, yeah, because it came out yeah. in two thousand four. But mm. yeah, so another film that we considered was the conversation, which was Coppola's film from nineteen seventy four, and you know that that was definitely one that we were really thinking about. But the problem is we've talked about that film on Cinemaholics before. So we were like, well, is there anything else? Something that we've never talked about before. And then, of course, a conversation would be more than more than worthy of conversation. But Ooh. the one I think that we're going to settle on for now, unless something changes, is Seven Samurai, which yes. is celebrating its 55th year. So 55 years. This one came out in 1964. Uh, 65. 65. Thank you. So 65 no. years, huge milestone, one of the best films of all time. And Sam, I think a film that... You know, you were real. I know you're really debating this one. I know you're a big fan of Kurosawa, but over Tina mm-hmm. Fey, hmm. uh, well, if you put when you put it that way, John, <laughs> it's there are only so many compromises I can make. Uh, fun fact, or maybe not so fun, I haven't actually seen Mean Girls, so that would have been, if nothing else, an opportunity. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah, well, we still uh, have a chance it, to talk about a film that Will hasn't seen because Will has not yet seen Seven Samurai. This is a great opportunity to get his kidding? eye on those screens. <laughs> Sam, you haven't seen Mean Girls. Don't don't give me this. Oh, thing. I see. How you it just is. compared Mean Girls to Seven Samurai. It wouldn't be the first time. Classic you know something though. I, I'm curious. What is technically like the minimum amount of uh, uh, the minimum age a movie has to be? Could we theoretically talk about something from 2009, or that would be too recent, wouldn't it? Um. Yeah, I would say at least 10 years for me. I don't know, John. What would you say? Yeah, I mean, five years. I mean, what would we talk about from 2009 up? Avatar. Those yeah. some you don't feel well, like I films think, that are. I wouldn't. I wouldn't dismiss Avatar because I do think that's a very good one to discuss, especially with the sequels coming out fairly sure, soon. Sure. So that's why I think ten might be the good cap. Right. That, Even but... ten to me feels kind of recent. I like the idea of doing things yeah. that are older than thirty years, but you know, yeah. we we don't have to be that strict for sure. Yeah, I can't wait till we could potentially talk about Tim Burton's Batman, but that's for another month. That's right. That's the 89 film. There are a lot of great 1989 films, and I think the competition for Extra Milestone is going to be much fiercer in the summer. But of course, we'll get to that soon. Now, if you're listening and you enjoy this conversation, gear up because we're going to be talking about Seven Samurai next month. So you'll want to check that film out as soon as possible. Stay posted on our Twitter and everything like that. Uh, We'll try to provide helpful links, but on how you can watch Seven Samurai. I, I believe it's available on some streaming services, but then also, as always, be sure to go seek it out at your local yes. library or see if a friend owns it, anything like that. Uh, there's always by, uh, good ways by to By next month, the uh, Criterion channel will have debuted, so that is also an option. It is. It is a Criterion movie, and it is one of those movies that I've considered getting the Criterion version of, because I believe it has a lot of great special features. So It does. But all right. That is this extra milestone. We went way longer than last (laughs) month, but I mean, it makes sense. Some Like It Hot is definitely a film that I could personally talk about for hours and hours and hours. But gentlemen, thank you so much for talking about this Billy Wilder film with me. I've always wanted to talk about Wilder on this podcast. So finally cross that off my milestone list. But with that, we will see you on the main show for Cinemaholics. As always, special shout out to all of our patrons who are checking this episode out early. Thank you as always for your patronage. And enjoy this episode and enjoy these bragging rights. But with that, from the Internet California, I am John Green. From the Internet Pennsylvania, I'm Will Ashton. From the Internet Colorado, I'm Sam Nolan. We'll see you all next time.